Welcome to RoboHub. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, Lauren. Uh, first of all, thank you for this uh, interview. Uh, my name is Kim Baraka. I'm a PhD student at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, and I'm also affiliated with the Technical University of Lisbon. Uh, so I'm pursuing a dual degree uh, in robotics. Um, and I'm focusing in my research mainly on algorithms for uh, human-robot interaction. Apart from my scientific career, I'm also a dancer. Um, I had a classical dance training, and I'm recently more interested in improvisational dance. So I perform, teach, and create work in dance um, in parallel of my scientific career. Great. Thank you so much. Can you tell us a little bit about what aspects of human-robot interaction you're most interested in? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I'm mainly interested in algorithms for planning. Uh, and when we talk about planning, we're talking about a robot that is treated as a decision-making agent. So imagine a human and a robot interacting together. Um, the robot has to constantly make decisions uh, as to its behavior. Um, and when I talk about behavior, uh, my research focuses mainly on social behavior. So that means not only you know motion, but also communicative behavior that includes you know, verbal behaviors, but also nonverbal behaviors, such as gesturing, gazing, uh, even maybe touch sometimes. So all of these, can, what we call multimodal interactions, are the types of actions that I'm, that I'm thinking of when I'm thinking about robot uh, actions. And so the planning of those social uh, behaviors or actions is something that I try to model um, in a way that we can use uh, in a computer science kind of framework. So mathematical models of um, humans and how to adapt to you know different contexts or different situations. But also, I'm specifically interested in adaptation to different types of individuals. And so, just to give you an example, the focus of my thesis is on a domain which is called socially assistive robotics. Uh, and more specifically, we're working with individuals with autism. So imagine a robot that um, is interacting with such individuals in the context of therapy. So the robot has to interact in a social way to, in a way, train um, individuals with autism to have better communication and social skills. And so it is really, really key to be able to know how to best interact with different types of individuals given their different abilities, different severities of the disorder, and so on and so forth. And so I'm interested mostly in um, models of interactions that could be useful for better adaptation of robot behavior and looking at how these models that are usually taken from outside the field of computer science or robotics. So I'm looking at models of interaction that come from psychology or um, standardized tools that are developed for therapy or like, and trying to see how these models could be useful to kind of bootstrap um, the efficiency of an interaction uh, and more specifically a social interaction. So that's kind of like the broad overview of, of, of my thesis, uh, my PhD thesis research. Great. So you mentioned that you have to kind of tailor these models to different types of individuals. How do you understand, mm -hmm. or how does a robot understand what type of individual it's interacting with? Right. So uh, depending on the context, we usually identify a set of features that will uh, characterize the, the individuals you're interacting with. So in the case of autism therapy, um, you know, the, the features that matter in an interaction are usually uh, features that code the response to some social behaviors or the initiation of some social um, situations or actions. And so if we have an understanding of, for example, um, if you look at diagnosis information, um, this diagnosis information in the case of autism is information that kind of implicitly codes how a certain individual would respond to certain situations or certain prompts that are typically used in uh, a social interaction. So to give you an example, this could be something about how the person uses gaze to initiate or modulate an interaction. 
their use of gestures such as pointing, how they respond to things like joint attention. So would they understand gestures? Would they understand facial expressions? And if we have that information, that is really something that is useful for robots to uh, kind of model the possible responses to what the robot would do. So if they have this understanding, they could better plan ahead and adapt to uh, ensure a more efficient or a more fluid interaction. So different severities of autism are usually associated with different um you know, different requirements in terms of like how much stimulation you should give. So if um, you have a child that is um, has trouble responding to uh, gestures or something called, a, a, you know, response to joint attention, wouldn't understand particularly well what pointing gesture means, you might want to really exaggerate the way you point or the way you gaze, or you might want to uh, activate the target that you want them to look at. Uh, in order for them to be able to respond effectively to those to those stimuli, but on the other hand, if you have you know an individual that is uh, good at joint attention or that responds uh, um, you know well to to this type of stimuli, you may not need to go all the way. Uh, you might just need a gaze shift, um, and so the robot could save some energy, could could even challenge the child to to become better at. Uh, uh, you know, uh, detecting those 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 uh, more subtle um, real behaviors, um, and that's really useful in therapy because because we want to always find the balance between you know over um, it, it being overly explicit in in, in, in the robot's actions versus uh, being too subtle and at the risk of not having you know a satisfactory response from the or from the child's perspective, because I'm working mainly with children. Of course. Um, yeah, so that's that's mainly that's mainly my response to your, to your question. Great, and I would imagine that it takes some time for the robot to learn and understand these features about the human. Can you describe what the timeline looks like for how long the robot spends exploring the capabilities of the child versus? when it decides how to employ certain techniques or is this kind of a repeated measure that if you have an interaction it's learning and then exploiting learning and then exploiting or is it completely separated into two separate phases and how do you time this process right, right. so i mean ideally in, you know, in an ideal situation and this is something that doesn't necessarily um, relate specifically to the to the autism domain you would want a robot to have kind of an idea of who you are as a person or how you interact or maybe an idea of humans in general. And then being able through interaction to kind of fine tune the way the robot interacts with you, right? So that's kind of like a general framework of having what we call a prior um, on your response to certain actions and then kind of collect data and kind of learn to fine tune the what we call the policy of the robot or how the robot behaves or makes decisions. So um, what we have explored so far in our re in, 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 in our uh, research uh, directions is to look at how can we construct this prior first. So how can we have initial information that might be different for different individuals? And one of the things we thought about was to look at, you know, in in a healthcare context, you do have access to information about a certain patient, right? So all patients are not the same. You cannot treat all patients the same um, as you would, for example, when you're developing a technology product and you expect the average user to use it in a certain way. This average patient doesn't really exist. It's really important to know how to um, maybe categorize or how to understand or to model patients in a different way. And so if you have access to this healthcare information, to this health record, um, which can, can be in our case a diagnosis, you can utilize that information directly on the robot saying, okay, given that this is the type of uh, autism that this person has or the, the severity of the autism of that person, maybe this is how the robot should model the person or this is how the robot should behave. Um, another, another problem is that a lot of times, you know, the way that people respond to humans is not the same as they, the way they, to, they respond to robots. And so what we need to understand is how 
this model can be, so what I would call the human-human interaction data could transfer or could, could generalize to human-robot interaction. And that's a, that's a research problem in itself. Um, and this mapping is not always clear. It might be something that is highly individual dependent. So you might have some individuals that respond in a very similar way to humans and robots, but you might have some some, some kids that, or some individuals in general that might be you know, more comfortable with robots than humans or, or less comfortable with robots than humans or afraid of robots. Or, so we really need to understand also this mapping and whether this mapping is useful in a certain situation. So what we do uh, in the studies that we've done with kids is we always have the robot kind of reiterate um, typical tests that humans, like therapists, usually engage in and comparing this data. So trying to see, okay, can we use the data that we have uh, from a human interaction directly, or do we need to collect, or do we need to give more importance to the ro to data the robot collected? I see. So, so typically, have, what the robot does. Yes. So you have kind of ahead. these. So you have kind of these two ways that the robot collects a prior on these children. One is the medical data that gets input to the system, perhaps manually or by a professional, and then you also right. can kind of confirm these priors by having the robot do certain exploratory actions with the children. And this is so important because there's such a difference between children, especially children with autism, right. is such a diverse population that you want to start the interaction with some sort of prior as opposed to starting the same with everyone and building it up over time because you want the beginning of the interaction to be meaningful as well, not yep. just later on in the interaction. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, but actually, actually, it turns out, like based on the studies that we've run, that we cannot trust the human data as much because exactly of that problem, that the way that especially children with autism, like younger children with autism, respond to robots um, can really differ from the human uh, response. So in a way, it is really needed for a robot to do an assessment before starting any kind of interaction. Um, and so the assessment that we do is usually, you know, it, it follows a typical algorithm that therapists would use to assess. So it goes hierarchically through increasingly uh, prompting actions, so increasing the stimulation level and seeing where the kid responds to a certain stimulus and using that information to then maybe personalize or uh, adapt based on this information. And so it turns out that we end up in the specific tasks that we look at, we ended up not using that human diagnosis information because we thought that it was not reliable enough to be used directly. So we have a first phase in which the robot is kind of like safely interacting with the child and going through these increasingly uh, stimulating actions until they have a better, um, until the robot has a better understanding of how the child responds. And once the robot has this understanding, then it uses that information to target uh, specific um, specific prompts to, to, to personalize basically the interaction. And so this is kind of like the insight we got from real world interactions. Uh, what we want eventually to develop, and this is research that we've been doing, is to model these things in a more, um, in a more mathematical kind of way. So being able to quantify these, these concepts uh, in terms of probabilities, in terms of costs. So what does it mean for an action to be costly? And so we're using concepts of decision theory or utility theory to be able to kind of, given a model of a child, assuming that we have this perfect model of a child, what should be the sequences of actions that the robot should take to be able to maximize some utility? And in our case, the utility has to do with how much, what is the, the, the just right challenge for that child? So how do you select your prompts or your actions so that you don't overly simplify things or make it too easy on the child, but also not making it too difficult for the child to not respond and just basically lose the flow of an interaction. So there's always kind of this trade-off in a naturalistic context when you have a robot interacting with a human, um, and especially in therapy where you're supposed to challenge the, the patient to, to get better over time. So how do, you, how do you model these things mathematically? And this is kind of the the latest research we've been doing um, in that context, yeah. Right, so I've heard you mention a few different things that you're trying to optimize, one of which seems to be 
how much stimulation, perhaps volume or expressiveness of gestures, should the robot be providing to the child because different children with autism have different tolerances or different requirements for how much stimulation is needed in order to have a response. Is that correct? That's right. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then the other thing that you're trying to optimize is the level of difficulty of the activity that you're trying to teach or the skill that you're trying to teach. And you're using decision theory to to understand what this optimal level is. Can you explain a little bit more about that? How does decision theory work in these different contexts? Right. So, I mean, the first model that we came up with is is simply to, you know, model this level of stimulation or the difficulty of a prompt as basically a probability that the child would respond. So we have this probabilistic framework in which if you make the prompt easy enough or, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, stimulating enough, then you have a higher probability of the child responding. So it's not just like a binary, the child will respond or will not respond. You, we're actually looking at quantifying these, um, these probabilities. And so for every action the robot takes, we have a measure of what is the probability, like out of a hundred trials that the robot would take, how many of those would be successful, right? So some, because sometimes a child would understand and respond, other times there might be other environmental factors that may make the child not respond for whatever reason. And so being able to put a number of those probabilities is something that is crucial in this model. The other thing is putting a number on the costs of such actions. And if you think about you know, the context that in therapy, for example, the cost of an action has to do with a therapeutic cost. So if an action is overly um, stimulating or, or too easy, that's a high cost because you're basically going too far from what a natural interaction would look like in the real world, and you're not challenging the child enough. Uh, you're making it maybe too easy. So you're not, you're not promoting an improvement over time. So this is how we model kind of this trade-off. You don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be spending too much of a cost if you don't need it, but also you don't want to be spending too little of a cost uh, because then you might have to repeat many times, and so you might kind of lose the flow of an interaction. Um, so this has to do with, for example, how much. Um, in our case, we're looking at things like joint attention, so we're looking at attention tasks. But you can think of it as in terms of like an educational scenario where you're tailoring the difficulty of a certain activity or a certain problem. Uh, you, don't, you know, if you're if you're making it too difficult on the student, then they might just be discouraged and might, they might just like decide to not continue the interaction. But if you're making it too easy, you know, they might get good grades, but you're not challenging them enough. Uh, to get better over time. And so we're trying to model this straight off in a a mathematical kind of way and have uh, uh, algorithms that would eventually generate optimal uh, either teaching sequences or in our case that would be social behaviors uh, on the robot side. Yeah. Right. And I'm sure one of the main factors in terms of making this model successful is having a way of evaluating those costs. So how do you measure online Mm -hmm whether there's a cost, whether there's a reward, and the value that you're going to assign to those costs and rewards. What are you, okay. what are you grabbing right. from the interaction in order to do that? Right. So the way that we model these costs is uh, something that we measure a, a priori. So it's something that we know. So we basically, it's a, it's a domain-specific knowledge, the costs. The costs are something that are kind of intrinsic to the actions that the robot uh, robot is going to take. So what we do is that we show the robot performing certain actions to experts. And experts will look at the robot and kind of tell us, um, basically rate the robot's behavior. So they will will ask things like how natural is the robot's behavior or how explicit is the robot's behavior. And those metrics will then be converted into cost functions, into actual continuous values on a scale from zero to one. And so based on this domain knowledge, we already know what the costs of the robots, uh, robots' actions are. What we need to learn uh, on the fly or what we need to assess is the probabilities of response of a specific child. This is something that varies from child to child. So the costs are, are kind of on the what we call the provider side, so on the robot side because it's something that's intrinsic to the actions. 
But then what varies from child with child is how these actions will create either successes or failures on the receiver side, so on the child side. And so this is something that we usually, uh, you know, we've collected a bunch of data from child-robot interactions and we've run some regressions on the data to be able to kind of extrapolate for a given uh, assessment of a child on like where in this hierarchy of actions does the child actually respond to convert these types of assessments to actual values, probability values. So is that like 80% chance of responding or is that like a 20% chance of responding? And this transition is something that is not straightforward because the way therapists evaluate kids is not through probabilities because those are things that humans wouldn't be able to assess accurately. What humans do are basically very binary things. So they try things and if it works, they keep a record of that. But then how do you go from that kind of framework to one where you actually quantify things and and then you know use these numbers to be able to then compute plans that are you know provably optimal for uh, a given model, assuming the model is correct, of course. Sure. Uh, another so completely different challenge is to actually make sure that this model stays the same over time. And this is a whole other type of uh, research on adaptation and online learning. But for now, we're trying to understand this kind of like first step of like given a model, how do you deal with this model? Right. Yeah. What's the biggest challenge that you guys are facing? The biggest challenge is to actually make assumptions that are going to hold true in, in real world because you can, you know, you can work in simulation as long as you want. You can assume many things, um, not just because it's intuitive, but sometimes looking at literature uh, from other fields, you know, you might expect, you know, a child with autism spectrum disorder to, to, you know, to uh, respond to a certain activity the same way a typically developing child would. Or you might think that you know, results from education might be applied to a therapeutic uh, scenario. And a lot of times these uh, results don't generalize. And so it's really, it's really challenging to make assumptions that are useful to be able to uh, you know, construct a certain scenario to test your algorithms on and then actually test those assumptions in the real world. And if they fail, to still be able to get something out of, out of your evaluation. Because you know, the more assumptions you make, the more complex you can have your scenario. But the more assumptions you make, also the more uh, risky it is to, to, to engage in such, in such studies. And so the balance between theory and practice, I think, is a really, really challenging one, given that you know, testing on special needs populations is, is very costly. It's something that is really hard to do, you know, uh, recruiting, you know, this type of, of, of children or is, is really a challenge, you know, working with the parents there. It's a very high stressful, uh, high stress kind of environment. Um, so you really need to be very mindful of how to invest uh, your energy and effort into what you want to test with, you know, real world scenario and what you can assume and test in simulation. And I think that the the balance is quite is quite hard to achieve sometimes. I'm sure, yeah, which is why that prior that you discussed before is is so important and doing the testing exactly instead of completely relying on the prior. Yep. Great. Exactly. Well thank you so much. And something else you mentioned at the beginning is that you're a dancer. Can you tell me yes. a little bit about that and how you balance kind of these two interests that you have. So what yeah. type of dance do you do? So, yeah, so, um, so I would say that since uh, high school, I've been, I've been involved in those, you know, in the science and the, in, the, in the arts at the same time. And those were really kind of two separate interests that I've been pursuing. They're actually passions. I would say that they're, they're actually passions because uh, I wouldn't consider, you know, my dance uh, work as, as just purely a hobby. I'm doing it also quite seriously on the side. Um, and I never got to really mix my dance background with, with my science until a one project that I did in, in Lisbon in which uh, there were a bunch of dancers in residence in a lab that were trying to interact with the robot through motion and physical contact. And I thought this was a great opportunity to kind of join them and trying to see, okay, what can we do on a technical level to facilitate this type of interaction. 
And maybe one thing I'll say that I've recently learned um, in dance that's drastically helped me think about interaction in, in robotics is that, especially in improvisation, improvisation is all about decision making, right? So it's all about making choices in real time, in an embodied way. So you are a body in a space, or you are a body interacting with another body, and you're basically a multi-agent system that needs to make decisions in real time. And this is what, we, what we're trying to do with robots. Um, so I see a lot of um, potential in using dance as a test bed for embodied intelligence and real-time decision making. Uh, maybe not necessarily for like artistic purposes, but also for because there's a lot of dance practices that are not just about you know beauty of the form and aesthetics, but actually about like really intelligent decision making with your body in real time. Um, with a lot of inspiration from the martial arts, for example, where you have a clear goal of you want to defend yourself, you want to escape, um, you want to escape a certain, um, you know, a certain uh, offense from your from your from your partner, and so all of this, um, all of those complex dynamics, I think, are really really interesting to explore from uh, from an AI point of view, from an agent's uh, decision making point of view. Um, and so I see this kind of interaction, maybe maybe in future research, uh, as, as a very, very interesting um, type of domain to, to delve into because it encompasses the social dynamics, maybe not verbal communication, but certainly nonverbal communication and coordination, but also this embodied intelligence of actual physical interaction. So we use a lot of physical contact uh, in contact improvisation so it's this type of dance where you have two bodies sharing or more uh, bodies sharing weight and uh, basically what emerges are those kind of behaviors in which the system as a whole is moving and you're not you're kind of losing your individuality as an agent so you're basically through sharing weight and through working with gravity bodies are evolving and it's the contact, the point of contact that moves you, which I think is a very interesting uh, concept that has been, you know, uh, around in multi-agent systems when you talk about emergent behaviors and distributed systems. Like, this is kind of the same things. Uh, I just don't think that a lot of people have thought of it that way. So I think there's a lot of things to that dance can bring into, um, into AI in general and into embodied intelligence more specifically so right so who knows maybe in the future i'll i'll merge those two things <laughs> sure. it's interesting you mentioned that there really is this combination of a physical interaction and a social interaction i'm thinking of you know a lift for example if you're going to lift someone up you have to both communicate to them that you're ready and that you're able to you know handle the move in a certain way but that also you have to apply forces in a certain direction and in a certain way with Definitely. relation to how the other person is moving so it's really kind of this multimodal yeah. interaction yeah, definitely. There's, I think there's so much social, um, there's so much social content in this type of interaction, especially in improv, that people tend to disregard. And sometimes this type of social interaction is extremely subtle. So you're not explicitly communicating things, but you're just looking at the corner of your eye where the body of the person is and what their attention cone is. And you're kind of, infer you're doing all these inferences and people that are good at improvising in dance are not necessarily dancers that are good at performing choreography. It's a different part of your brain that you're training. And so I think there's so much, so, so many layers of intelligence in, in this type of, 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 of dance improvisation that definitely um, is maybe more subtle social dynamics, but the social dynamics are definitely there, especially in regards to communication coordination and um, working with with different uh, social roles even because you have you know uh, social structures that start forming um, the first one being leader follower uh, or no leader no follower just working as a team but also you know group dynamics and and all sorts of other then you can just escalate into all of the different layers of social interactions that you, humans have um, right. which so are definitely all issues that we're a lot to, to uncover there. Yeah. Right, which are also all issues that we're looking to explore in robotics as well. Definitely, yes. Can you speak a little bit personally now to, since, you know, as a PhD student, 
many of us are, of course, struggling as to how to or trying to figure out how to balance interdisciplinary interests or interests in and out of the lab, whether they're robotics related or, you know, just personal hobbies. How do you balance these two interests and passions that you have? Yeah, so I would say it's it has been hard in the past to do that, especially when you you know you have a schedule of courses that is quite rigid. You know, as you evolve through your PhD, I think it's easier to manage your time the way you want. Things become more flexible. You know, you're able to. I am able to go, for example, every day for a training, whether it's in the morning or in the evening, and I kind of like shift my work hours around it. But I think it's a skill that I've kind of developed naturally in you know, through all these years of of having to balance both. And I think as long as you, you feel the need to, like for me, those two things are very complimentary, Uh, having to, you know, work your brain, uh, you know, so many hours a day, but also having to, to have something, you know, physical, but also something creative uh, that completes uh, or kind of complements the the other side is something that I've always uh, you know, seek. Like I always felt like if I'm only focusing on one of these things, I I feel incomplete in some way. And so, in a way, you find time for it because the the will is there. Uh, it doesn't feel like oh, I have to go to dance training now. Or I have to fit it. Uh, so or or oh, I have to go to the lab now. I'd rather dance all day. No, I'd rather maybe not dance. Or maybe I'll dance all day today, but then I'll I'll, I'll research all day tomorrow. Uh, but I think it's something that this duality uh, in my personality is something that kind of drives this naturally. Uh, but it definitely needs a lot of time management skills. And that, I think, is the, is the key. Um, but I think as long as you are passionate about something, um, my advice is to not think that if you're doing a PhD or if you're going into a kind of like high stress kind of career uh, to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to sacrifice what I really like or my hobby. Um, if you really are passionate about something, that's going to help you in your in your other stuff, uh, definitely. So it's worth investing time in it. If it's something that drives you and motivates you, uh, you can always find time for it, definitely. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing where your research and dance goes.